It's my pleasure to welcome you to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve and empower you so you make better financial choices in your life. Speaking of financial choices, teenagers are growing up very differently, even from their older siblings now, with how money operates. And teens are a hot market for the fintechs, one of which is Square. And Square has decided they've got to get in teenagers' hands before somebody else does. So Square has come up with an idea for teens that I'm going to talk about in just a second. Later, I want to talk about a key skill you need as a worker to be successful. And I'm going to tell you what it is and how to master it. So teens and money, parent of three children, one's now 32, one's 22, and one is 16. I would give myself, as somebody who does what I do for a living, what felt like at the time each was a teen, a D minus on how I did with the money thing. And then what I didn't realize was they were absorbing a lot of stuff from me and not my lectures. It's your actions that really count. And when they ask you a question, that's when they're really absorbing it. So my oldest is phenomenally careful with money and was just asking me a question the other day about her Roth IRA and the way it's invested and her 401k. And I thought that was really great. And she started her first Roth right out of college when she was working as a vet assistant at a veterinary medicine practice during the Great Recession. And my middle child, who's 22 as I mentioned, she's going to graduate from college in May. And I've been really fascinated as her questions about money and saving have become steadily more sophisticated and she's become more and more careful with money. And with her, different than her older sister, we tried what was called a youth spending account with USAA where she had a cash card that came with it. USAA doesn't use that product anymore, but it was, the idea was it was handling uh, non-traditional money with training wheels. And it was hard for her to adopt to it. Now she's really got money down really solid. And she uses a combination of cash, Venmo, credit, and she seems to have it together. And her amount of money in her savings account keeps going up because she works while she's in college. And she's been doing well. My 16-year-old wouldn't know cash if it hit him in the face. It's crazy. I, 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 I cannot get him interested in cash as a means of purchasing things at all. And everything's electronic through his phone. And it's just how he does things. And his generation or sub-generation, that's what they're going to do. And that's who cash app is after is they're issuing a form of debit card to kids starting at 13 years old which is a new frontier in a lot of cases except for the small number of institutions that had youth spending programs that weren't a ripoff and so cash wants to beat Venmo to the game and anybody else who'd like to get people as the habit they have formed early. So as a parent, know that your uh, teen pretty quickly will know that their friend, whoever, has this and they'll want to have it too. So this requires you as a parent to set up the account, you have to give permission, and you essentially get to control it. Whether it's Cash App or can you do it with Venmo too? Venmo have to be 18 or over. This is a cash app thing, although uh, who knows 
tomorrow Venmo may right, decide right. to jump in here too. And I think there's so much value with a single digit and a teenager to have to deal with actual cash because you see the finite supply. The hard part for me with any form of either electronic, like my son doing everything with Apple Pay, or with someone using plastic or using an app like the Cash App, is you don't see the finiteness of the money. And I've not come up, I've been struggling for a long time to come up with a way to get the concept through of the finiteness that the physical presence of money creates. So it's going to be up to you as a parent to be experimental if you do say to your kid, okay, you can have the cash app and you monitoring it to do the best teaching you can. Like when your kid calls and says, hey, they wouldn't let me buy something because they <laughs> declined my, my app. What's up, dad? <laughs> <laughs> so those are the teaching moments when your kid says, what's up? What do I do? Speaking of which, I got to say something about my 22 year old. She drives an electric car and didn't get around to charging it the other day and went to work. And she didn't have enough charge left to get back to her apartment. Oh boy. So she calls me and, and basically, Dad, fix it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and where she was, she lives in Los Angeles, she lives in Pasadena. And she was in a part of Los Angeles called Koreatown working. And the only charger she could make it to was one that's for hotel guests at a hotel four miles away. She had to pay a valet <laughs> to take the car and charge it. And it was a very expensive lesson learned. And those are the moments. <laughs> for a parent with a kid because this is the funny thing we were talking the night before and she'd been on a long drive going to get something i said steffi do you have enough range left on your car do you need to go charge her? she said oh i'm fine <laughs> but she wasn't and that's it with our kids you know they learn when they're ready and nobody got hurt it was just yeah. extra money but she learned and you know what she won't do that again. That's right. That's right. My I have a, my sixteen year old needs to learn everything the hard way. Everything. My older well, one does not. The kids have to learn everything the hard way. Learn the lessons for life. Maybe. Fingers crossed. This question's from Peter in Minnesota. Clark mentioned that rules for grandparent owned five twenty nine accounts were changing. My daughters are currently in their freshman years, one in high school and one in college, and my parents are hoping to fund some of their education. If a grandparent-owned 529 account won't hurt the kids' financial aid, I'd like to advise them to put the funds for the high schooler in a 529 and part of the funds for the college kid in their state's 529 plan, which offers a tax deduction and is on Clark's dean li Dean's list. But I don't want to do that if the 529 will hurt their aid. What's the latest on the change and when will it be implemented? So the new change is already in place for uh, this past fall semester is that it used to be that kids were punished for what financial aid they would qualify for if there was 529 money from a grandparent. And it was kind of idiotic and the rules have changed and now that no longer affects eligibility for financial aid any different than a parent's money in a 529. In short, the way it works is that money in a kid's name hurts them horrifically for financial aid in college. Money in a parent's name does not. What happened before was any money a grandparent did was treated as if it was a kid's money and ate them up on financial aid. And thank goodness that's over. Now, the thing you brought up about qualifying for the state tax deduction, you'll, uh, your parents will have to check the rule in their state to see whether a grandparent giving money to a 529 also qualifies for the state tax deduction or only if the parent of the child is doing it. 
just confirm that first. This is from Carol in New Jersey. What is the difference between a will and a trust? So a will is uh, properly drawn is the legal document that says what you want to have happen with your stuff and if you have minor children, what happens with your minor children at the time of your passing. It's where you designate your list of wishes. A trust is a document that uh, generally involved at somebody's death is a document that lives on that controls access to funds or assets of an individual. I'm trying to think the right way to say this. So let's say you passed a piece of real estate in a trust. Then it goes to that individual and usually there will be a trustee who is considered to be a legally responsible fiduciary, meaning that they have to do what's in your best interest as the beneficiary of the trust. Um, the most often reason in a will that a trust is used is if there are minor children and you need somebody, to, if there's going to be assets, if you prematurely die while your kids are still young, or if you have someone who is self-destructive who might inherit from you, or you have someone who has a maturity or spending problem, that's one of the reasons people will put things in a trust at time of their death, the will will call for, I think it's called, I think the lawyers call it a testamentary trust, that it passes to that, and then there will be a trustee, maybe another trusted family member, could be a third party institution, could be what's called a trust institution that would manage it, and then as the will calls for, give the money out to the individual. Uh, many times if somebody has a uh, substance abuse problem, a gambling problem, whatever, this would be a reason that you'd put assets or funds or investments in a trust and have a trustee to make sure the individual didn't blow through all the money. This is from Abby in Georgia. Oh, I, I'm sorry, Krista. Oh, I should say there are other reasons why trusts would be used. I just gave you like a quick windshield survey at uh, 50 miles an hour and if you're preparing a will, that's the time to talk with a lawyer who specializes in wills, estates, and trusts. And they will tell you if the situation you have calls properly for having certain things in a trust instead of being passed through a will. So Abby and Georgia says, I have, have $18,000 sitting in a Fidelity 401k from a job I left several years ago. I now work in film, which utilizes a pension for retirement, although I'm not sure I want to stay in this industry. What should I do with that 401k? I'm 32 years old. I do not have an IRA. Okay. Um, so first things first, you're 32. You already had this money in a 401k. And I'm very impressed with you for doing that. A lot of people in their 20s don't ever get around to doing that. And that's great. You have uh, nearly $20,000 in there. So if the company you work for was a really large employer, they probably have a very low cost Fidelity 401k plan. There's nothing wrong at all with just leaving it there. The company's required to let you leave it open. And you may be benefiting from what's called institutional share costs on the funds that your 401k is in that would potentially be higher than what you could do on your own, moving the money from the 401k to an IRA. So in your case, I think it's fine to leave it there. Um, opening an IRA is a great idea regardless. You can leave that money behind and open your own Roth IRA, which you're allowed to put up to $6,000 a year into and have it grow tax-free and spend the money from it tax-free down the road. And I have a basic investing guide on Clark.com where you can read how a Roth IRA works, how I'd fund it, and in your case, since you already have a Fidelity 401k, to keep things simple, you could also open your Roth IRA with Fidelity. Now, speaking of employers, as we were just talking about, mm -hmm. going from working for a traditional company to working in the film industry, do you know that most of us are just terrible at negotiating our pay? And it's one of the most important things you can do through your working lifetime because it could cost you 
a huge amount of money, years of additional work, so many things that you're harmed by if you just are meek. This is a case where the meek don't inherit the paycheck. There's one thing that so many of us are so bad at. That's advocating for ourselves. We may be fiercely good at advocating for a friend or a relative, one of our kids. But when it comes to advocating for ourselves, we're really lousy at it. And one area that most people are pathetic at is negotiating salary or salary increases. A lot of people just say, oh, well, they offered me this. And they just accept whatever an employer tells them. Or the, the employer will say at a time of review, well, this year we're giving guideline raises of 1.5% or less. And so we're going to give you the 1.5%, even though inflation is 5.5% right now. And you say, OK. And then you'll complain to your friends or whatever, or your spouse or partner or whatever that, no, no, no. You got to stand up for yourself. And you have a new tool in the game. It's really helpful to know what approximately your job is worth. Colorado has a law that has employers furious, furious, because Colorado employers have to disclose what their employees make. It's public information. You can go see, hey, I do that kind of work. They're making this, and they're paying me that. The other thing in the cycle of the Great Resignation, which I think we're moving into the later innings, uh, people just canning a job, going to do whatever, but you have a lot more power as an employee than you realize. And by the way, historically, women are much worse at asking for money than men. It's a cultural, societal thing that women don't speak up for themselves uh, generally. This is a general trend. It's not true of every woman and every man. But women tend to not self-advocate when it comes to pay. So you don't threaten an employer. You don't say, hey, you know, if you don't give me blah, 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 I'm going out the door. But you test the market. Even if you like where you are, there's nothing wrong with you seeing what you're worth somewhere else. Well, know the value of your own work and present that to your employer. What value are you bringing them? Um, and I think that's a great way to approach it, usually. But you're also competing with yourself then, Krista, because if you don't know if there really oh, you is wanna more know. money yeah. No, out for there. sure you do, but I think also, like, you, you want to know what the average salaries are, and then when you're presenting it, like you are someone who brings value to your employer, and so that makes sense. Like That's something I think we're not all really great at. You don't want to just say, oh, well, the average for my salary is this, and you're paying me this. I think you also advocate for yourself and toot your own horn. I think some, that's something a lot of people aren't very good at. Well, there was a radio station when I was uh, a radio host long ago, radio station I was at, there was a young woman who was a receptionist. And she kept wanting to go into sales at the radio station. They'd kind of pat her on the head and say, aren't you cute? And one day she uh, decided that she was going to go look for a radio sales job somewhere else. And she leaves, goes to another competitive, competitive station, and knew the business so well from everything she was doing. She uh, just took off running as a salesperson, was doing very well. And then the funniest thing of all is the station that had patted her on the head and would never even let her have an opportunity in sales hired her back at 10 times what she was making. I love it. 10 times what she was making as receptionist. But she was a great saleswoman, and that's how she was able to do that. So you have more power than you give yourself credit for. And I think about the questions we get from people who are working as ICs, independent contractors, and they feel like whatever they're told, that's what they're going to get. Oh, so they told me they'll pay me blah, blah, blah. You know, independent contractors, are, uh, there are times somebody wants to stay an IC. 
But a lot of times it's for the pleasure and benefit of the employer because they're not having to give you the benefits and pay the taxes that they have to when you're an employee. Know that those are real expenses to you. And when you are looking at a job as a independent contractor, freelancer, whatever, the hourly rate an employee makes, you should expect that times 1.3 as a freelancer. So if somebody's making 15 an hour as an employee, then for you as an independent contractor, what would that what would that be? 1.3. That would be um, 1650. No, wait, did I get that right? It would be uh, 15 an hour times 1.3. Krista, you are an English major. <laughs> I should be able to do the math in my head. Do you want a calculator? And, no, wait. I'm thinking 30. It would be 20 an hour. Okay, great. Approximately. Somebody, please. You don't need to post on Clark Stinks that I messed <laughs> up the math. But you get the idea, which is the important thing, is you don't, and you don't demand from an employer. This is very important. This is a respectful conversation. And if you are what I call politely assertive and you give the employer the reasons why you feel you deserve more money, and they say, hey, that's what we pay for your job. Get out of here. Or they might just say no, which is yeah, fine. Right. I mean, maybe it's not, reasons. and then you leave. But There yeah. could be reasons, and you have to decide what you do from that. Mm -hmm. But I don't want you to be a spectator in your own life. I want you to make sure that your skills are respected, that your promotability is respected, and that the pay level that you deserve for the work you do is representative of what would generally be true in the marketplace. Let's get to some questions. This is from Tom and Todd in North Carolina. I know I'm underinsured in my life insurance and need to purchase more. As far as the amount needed, I've heard various things ranging from seven times your salary to 12 times your salary, with 10 times your salary being the most common. But there's one area I never hear discussed. Do I take into consideration the amount of personal and retirement savings I already have saved, whether it be in an emergency fund or more importantly in a retirement account? For example, if I make 50K a year and 10 times that amount is the amount of insurance I need, that's 500K, but I have 200K saved up in a work retirement 401K already, do I need to purchase the remaining shortage of 300,000 or do I still need to con be considering the full $500,000 amount to cover my family should I die? Also, is life insurance and or retirement accounts taxable to my family upon my death? Okay, so let me deal with the first part first. You know, the formulas that say seven times, 10 times, 12 times, I just use a back of the envelope 10 times. And the reason I do when I'm recommending a level term policy is your point is 100% valid and an insurance salesperson would say that anybody like me just throwing out a number like 7x, 10x, you mentioned 12x, that that's the height of arrogance and does not focus on the needs of that individual, what debts that individual has and what assets they have. Those things are true, but when I try to get you to buy insurance, I like you to buy level term insurance that you would own for a period of 10 to 30 years. If you buy 10 times your income now for a policy that you're going to have in place uh, typically 20 or 30 years, because most often level term is bought as a 20-year or 30-year purchase, inflation is going to erode the value of that benefit. And it will mean that the payout from it will be less generous effectively in dollars at that time than it is now. So 10 times it's just a number that brings me comfort feeling like it will help with some of the inflationary effects that will occur over the years that will erode the value of that face amount. And if you were to die too soon and you leave uh, an excessive amount of money to your heirs, they will appreciate that a lot more than if you leave an insufficient amount. But you can go on the web and there are a number of financial calculators where you can put in the debts you have, the assets you have, the investment and retirement accounts you have, and it will come back with an approximation 
of what uh, amount of face amount you should have. But term insurance, level term insurance is so inexpensive and inflation is such a danger over time. I just like back of the envelope 10 times on the treatment of insurance with tax. So you have to have a very large estate for tax to be an issue. But if you're married, your spouse, if they are the beneficiary of the life insurance, it flows to them completely tax-free as a marital asset. For your kids it, or some other family member, it only becomes an issue for your estate if you have a massive estate. Uh, in today's standards, that would be, I think, north of $11 million. So this, the issue of taxation applies very rarely. There are a small number of states that like to get their hands on money that someone inherits, but it's very rare and not a lot of money typically. So I wouldn't worry as much about that unless you are uh, actually worth a huge amount of money and we're not talking about the full scale of money you have. This is from Wolfgang in Florida. I have T-Mobile and want to upgrade from the Samsung Galaxy S7 to the S10 or S20, but they don't offer the S10 or S20 on the trade-in. Would it be best for me to just buy an S10 or S20 on eBay and then just keep the S7 as a backup phone if needed? I have had good luck with buying phones on eBay for a fraction of the price, so I'm just wondering if I should do that without being able to take advantage of the trade-in. So Wolfgang, or as it would be pronounced in your Wolfgang, I want to tell you that you are incredible because you're using a 7, S7, which is from quite a few generations ago, and you're looking at going at a 10 or a 20 when right now Samsung's on the S22 Ultra. I mean, they uh, see so you're looking generations back. You will do very well doing what you're thinking of doing. You've got much more capabilities with the S10 or the S20. You'll be able to buy it really inexpensively on eBay, as you said. I think that's a great plan. And the capabilities, particularly the S20 versus the S7, will be night and day different. It'll feel great to you. And from Julian, New Hampshire, I received a notice from the rate review department of my mortgage company. It's urging me to take a new fixed low rate of 1.75%. It says I have to call within five days of this notice to lock in this rate. Is this a scam? I'm currently paying on a 30-year fixed 3.8%. So Julia, uh, 38 historically was phenomenal. Right now, not so much. You refied into a 1.99 recently? 1.875. 1.875. And the 15 rates... 15 year. 15 year. 15 well. year. The rates have been bouncing around some, but uh, up a little this week, down the next, but they're still great. Not at their absolute lows they were a few months ago, but still incredible. And don't know if this is really from your mortgage company, who it's from. I want you to look up the number of your mortgage company, but not just shop with them. I'd like you, Julia, to go to a mortgage broker and preferably a credit union and get quotes. On a refi, you can get as many quotes as you want, see what the marketplace is offering. Don't just look at the rate. The closing costs matter a lot. And you want to compare the closing costs from lender to lender and the rate as well. And as Krista said, she went into a 15-year loan. I don't know how long, Julia, you've had your 30-year loan out, but you could look at doing a refi into a 20-year, or if you can afford the payment, into a 15-year. But yes, if your credit standing's good, you can potentially cut the rate you have right now in half, which is quite a gift to your wallet. And I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode. You want more advice for your wallet? Check out Clark.com, and for the best deals around the clock, check out ClarkDeals.com as we serve you 24-7, 365. Nobody ever uses that expression anymore, do they? <laughs>